All right. So welcome to the post-growth entrepreneurship class at the University of Amsterdam. This class is going to be a bit different than you're used to. Okay. Um, what is this class about? I'm going to call this non-extractive entrepreneurship. I'm not talking per se about resource extraction. So this class is not about uh, gas or oil. <laughs> uh, however, what this extraction is that we're talking about is financial extraction. So what exactly is financial extraction in business and entrepreneurship? Why is it there? What difference does it make? And how do we get rid of it? That's actually the basic fundament of this whole course. Similar with uh, social entrepreneurship, this is also a course for idealists. So those who really want to use business to make the world better. So that, you know, but then pr preferably without greenwashing, th this is actually what this course is about. We will ask fundamental questions that you don't get a whole lot in other entrepreneurship classes, such as, is growth good? Yeah, because of course most of the time with entrepreneurship classes, we're automatically going to be assuming that uh, if we're starting a company, we want a hockey stick, right? <laughs> you know, we want the exponential growth for our company. But in this class, we're going to pause and we're going to ask the question, is this actually the best for achieving not just our goals personally, but also for society and also for the planet? What's the alternative that will be presented in this class? The other question that we're going to ask is, who is the startup ecosystem working for, really? So if I'm a founder and I go to a business incubator, you know, I need some help getting my startup off the ground. Is this program designed to help me as the founder? Or is this program in place to perpetuate other interests? That's also part of what this class is going to be about. So what we're going to do in this class is we're really going to focus on system change. You know, everybody likes to complain about the system. Right? And we know that the majority of the problems in this world are created directly or indirectly through business. And we blame the system. But what is the system? You know, can you actually describe the system? Can you actually name the moving parts in the system? Can you, can you tell me how they all interact? You know, how, how all these different pieces move. Because here's the thing. It's just like with any uh, mechanical device or electronic device. You know, you, you have tinkerers. You have people who can take this system and then disassemble it, you know, see what the parts are, and then be able to put it back in a different configuration. That's what this class is about. <laughs> You know, it's about recognizing these parts, being able to break it down into its moving pieces, and then being able to reassemble them in a way that the system can do things that it maybe wasn't intended to do. It's hacking at its finest. But then with business and the financial system. So really what we're trying to do here is to provide actionable uh, items that we can do as entrepreneurs. So again, it's also a no one thing to complain about the system. It is something else entirely to actually present tools to fix it. So there is going to be some amount of, you know, whiny negativity in this class, you know, in describing, of course, all the things that are wrong. But the real strength of this class, though, is that we will give you concrete tools that you can use to move past that. So this is actually quite, I would say, an optimistic class in the sense that uh, we are trying to empower you and enable you <laughs> to be able to be that change that you want to see in the world. So the revolution starts in our heads. The first step is dreaming up what can be done. <coughs> 
So this course is going to have a few different parts. And we're going to start with an introduction. First, I'm going to tell you a bit about myself. So who am I? Why am I here? Why did the university invite me to give you this class? Okay. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to talk about how to make business personal. Business isn't just for getting people rich. It can be. <laughs> Oftentimes it is. But really the question is, how can you create a business that is well suited for you, for you as a human being? Okay. The next part of this course that we're going to look at is breaking down the status quo. So what exactly is business? How does it currently work in the grand edifice of the way things are now? We're going to also consider the topics of financial extraction and growth, as I mentioned earlier. And then we're going to look at the Silicon Valley model. So I'm sure that you all, of course, are familiar <laughs> with uh, capital scaling, exiting your companies. This is taught in pretty much every entrepreneurship class. But you know, we're going to actually dig a little bit deep behind the surface. And we're going to ask why. Why exactly are things the way that they are? And should they be this way? How can they be different? We're also going to look at the architecture of the startup ecosystem. Again, you all are probably familiar with things like startup incubators. But again, why are they structured this way? How can we do things differently? <coughs> business education, also. <coughs> business schools. <laughs> you know, We need to transform our curriculum. This class is part of it. But uh, we're also going to look at the reasons why. We're then going to start to think about how to, how to bring change. Of course, social enterprise is the obvious answer. Of course, most of us would think this is sort of the most progressive you know, uh, way you know, to also bring impact to business. But it turns out that there is greenwashing, and we can go one step further. So we're going to actually, in, in the sense, you can think of post-growth entrepreneurship as kind of like social enterprise plus plus. <laughs> you know, so how do you take that one step further? Um, on top of that, then we're going to discuss post-growth entrepreneurship as a methodology. So first of all, what is post-growth? Right? <laughs> uh, actually, how many of you in here are familiar with the term post-growth? Raise your hands. A few hands? All right. How about degrowth? <laughs> the same set of hands. <laughs> so you've got post-growth, degrowth, donut economics. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll get this in the... Uh, in the, in the uh, economics classes. But really what we're doing with this class is we're trying to take these concepts of post-growth, degrowth, and the donut and actually translate it down one order of magnitude to the entrepreneurship uh, level. Because of course, what is an economy? It's a meta concept that consists of, you know, in part, businesses. And of course, in order to understand how to implement a post-growth economy or a degrowth economy, that begs the question of how do I create a post-growth or a degrowth business? <laughs> so uh, one part of this that I am going to spend some time talking about is bootstrapping. Uh, bootstrapping, of course, is the act of starting a business without external capital. Uh, of course, we hear in our entrepreneurship educations a lot about venture capital. <laughs> uh, this is going to be a bit of a critical look at VC and uh, also discuss why we might want to consider alternatives. And then also actionably, we're going to describe how do you actually perform that alternative. So uh, we're going to look at it really from a methodological uh, standpoint in three layers. Uh, the micro layer, which is basically me on a personal level as a human being, right? Then we've got the meso level, which is the business level. So how do I deal with this uh, you know, if I'm running a business and with organizationally speaking, with like tools like uh, you know, uh, management and uh, <laughs> legal contracts and taxes and you know, all that kind of stuff. And then you've got the macro level, and that is basically the macroeconomic level, and also considering how do you actually build ethical supply chains. And then the final bit is I'm going to show a little bit of the infrastructure that we have built in practice. So what kinds of incubators actually already exist <laughs> uh, that work in this uh, different, different new way? 
And on top of that, what about investment and finance? You know, we're used to hearing a whole lot about uh, VC, <laughs> you know, and other forms of uh, financing. How exactly does investment and financing work in trying to build a post-growth economy? You know, you, you're going to have to think a slightly different way, and that is going to be presented towards the end of this class. And then, of course, you know, how can we take all of these tools and use them to move things forward, you know, so we can build this new normal that we were promised, <laughs> you know, at, at, the, uh, at, at the end of the pandemic when actually it seems like very much nothing has changed. So, all right. But first, I guess now the question of who am I? Right? <laughs> so the first thing that you need to understand is that I am not your traditional business person. Right? I don't have an MBA. I didn't go to business school, which is one of these grand ironies that I'm sitting here lecturing you guys <laughs> in a business school when I did not go to business school myself. But what I do have is years of practical experience as an entrepreneur. I'm a computer scientist. I actually originally started as a assistant professor of computer science at the Free University of Amsterdam. Okay? In the computer systems gr group specialized in cybersecurity. So in short, I'm a computer hacker. So <laughs> I'm running a company of about 50 people uh, with basically ethical hackers. So in other words, uh, companies, governments, uh, nonprofits, and NGOs, they hire us in to hack them, tell them how we did it, and then give them tips for how to fix it, right? And it's a really fun job. I mean, my company, it's called Radically Open Security. Uh, we have been hired in by everyone from uh, Google, to the European Commission. We've uh, done security audits on applications from the Corona Melder, <laughs> you know, in the DCC, basically the QR code uh, for the, on the Corona apps, like Corona Check, uh, to the Dutch Power Grid. <laughs> you know, we work with companies like, uh, like Tenet, uh, Aneco Staden, for example, large insurance companies like Ehom, uh, also other large you know, things like uh, Mozilla Foundation, Wikimedia, uh, but also nonprofits, NGOs, and civil society organizations where we work on a nonprofit basis at, at cost price. But the thing about radically open security that's a little bit weird is that we are a not for profit company. What does that mean, not for profit company? So when I first started the company roughly eight years ago, I made the somewhat unconventional decision to sell my company for one euro to a foundation. So my company is 100% foundation owned. We also registered with a very obscure Dutch tax construction called, in Dutch it's called a Fiscal Fondswervende Instelling, a fiscal fundraising institution. And this is basically a construction from the Dutch church. So sometimes a church wants to do a commercial spinoff, right? <laughs> you know, and it is going to uh, raise some money of some kind, and then it's going to give that money with a tax benefit back to the church. Now, the most famous example of this is the Language Institute, Regina Chaley, otherwise known as the Nonnen van Furcht, the Nuns of Furcht. <laughs> and basically, this is a, in the Netherlands, a famous language institute in which our Queen Maxima here, actually, she learned her Dutch at this language institute. And it was started by the nuns, and the prophets go back to the nuns. Now, we, I, I decided to take this construction and make my so-called commercial spin-off a cybersecurity company, and then to make my, uh, you know, my uh, so-called church, the NLNet Foundation. And NLNet is a, uh, you know, a charity, internet-related charity that donates money to open source, digital rights initiatives, and anything for a better, open, transparent internet. So those of you who know a little bit about technology, you might recognize some of the names that are funded. Uh, GNU, 
Tor, Jitsi, DNSSEC, Wirecard, you know, re really just like anything for a better internet. So, and, and in such, we are legally required to donate 90% of our profits to charity at the end of every year. The 10% that we don't donate is our cash flow buffer. That's what I basically need to make payroll every month. <laughs> so, you know, but I mean, can you imagine operating a business where you basically donate all of your non-reinvested profits to charity at every year? It's like we get to December and I mean, <laughs> you know, it really drains uh, the contents of your bank account. It, it's like a ballet with money. Of course, when I first told people in the beginning that I wanted to start a not-for-profit company that donated all its profits to charity, of course, people thought I was either crazy or lying. <laughs> uh, they didn't actually believe that you can basically give away all of your profits, uh, non-reinvested profits, and still survive as a company. But eight years later, you know, we've grown to a company of 50 people. We've had hundreds of customers and we have donated 750,000 euros to the NLNet Foundation uh, in, uh, well, basically in the first uh, seven book years, which is something that I'm re really very proud of. But it also uh, really demonstrates the concept that you can actually build a social enterprise that donates not 5% of its profits, not 10% of its profits, but it basically donates all of its profits to charity. And it can not only survive, but it can thrive. So, um, you know, of course, you know, <laughs> dis you know, despite the skeptics, we have made a success out of it. And the company has won several awards. 50th most innovative SME uh, in the Netherlands, according to the Dutch Chamber of Commerce. Uh, CTO magazine called me the most innovative IT leader of the Netherlands. I was also a finalist for the EU Women in Innovation Prize, so one of the nine most innovative women in the European Union. So I'm not saying this uh, to puff myself up, <laughs> but I'm saying this because it, it, it is, it's not about me, it's about the business model, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it's about the fact that we should be using businesses, you know, as a form of activism, you know, and, and openness and transparency and all of these things. It's a validation also from all of these different places, you know, and I'm not the only one who can do this. Any of us can choose to do this, but of course, in order to make a choice, you first need to understand that that choice exists. And most people right now don't even understand that the choice is there. In essence, what I'm doing, I'm not this secret magical unicorn, you know, who's the only person who can do it. It turns out actually that I'm kind of late to the game. There's actually a whole bunch of other companies that are doing very similar things. The um, movement is called steward ownership. Perhaps you've, uh, you've heard the term. <laughs> it's a little bit different, uh, but the whole concept with steward ownership uh, in its fundament, you're separating voting rights from profit rights, but actually what I'm doing, the part of the steward ownership that I like is not just having foundation-owned companies, but also there's a construction called the golden share that you put in place to prevent your company from ever being sold. Of course, when you tell people that you don't want to sell your company, you, you have to remember selling your company, the exit, is the definition of success in entrepreneurship that you are taught in most incubators and also in most business school programs. <laughs> so setting up businesses where you make it literally legally you know, impossible to sell <laughs> flies into the face of all common sense and convention. And you would ask the question, why? Why would I want to do this this way? See, the reason why you'd want to do it this way is to protect the social mission, to build a company for the long term that will never sell out, <laughs> you know, that actually has its business as its business model rather than, you know, selling equity, you know. To, and this can help to prevent also mission drift uh, in the business that you're building. Of course, when I first started it, I didn't know any of this. <laughs> right? Uh, I was just basically a computer scientist who, as a reluctant entrepreneur, stumbled into entrepreneurship as a necessary evil because I thought the
the cybersecurity industry was too commercial, <laughs> you know, and I thought that I would be able to start something better. So anyway, it is with these eight years of practical experience that I have distilled it out into a number of lessons, uh, many of which I'm teaching in this class. Another thing also is that four years ago, I started an incubator called Nonprofit Ventures. This is a incubator for nonprofit, non-extractive startups. So basically, uh, my company was reasonably successful and a lot of other founders or aspiring founders went up to me and they said, hey, Melanie, can you teach me how to do that? Can you teach me how to build a not-for-profit company that gives away its profits to charity, but then in other areas? Yeah. And so, you know, I, I, I took to, to starting to write everything down, you know, and distill out the lessons that I'd learned. We started with a startup boot camp uh, on Terschelling, uh, <laughs> a one week physical event uh, before the pandemic in uh, February of 2020. And then of course, then the pandemic hit and then we moved it online. And then we, since that time, we had two more cohorts and each cohort had roughly between 12 and 15 founders. So Nonprofit Ventures has already incubated almost 50 startups with a focus on nonprofit steward ownership and cross subsidizing charity business models. So, you know, the materials that you're going to be learning in this class are by and large very similar to the materials that I'm also teaching in this incubator. But of course, with the understanding that you are students, you're not actively starting a business right now, <laughs> not now. <laughs> maybe later, maybe someday, <laughs> but I'm at least trying to plant some seeds so that if you ever do, that uh, you can have a, a few more ideas and a little bit more direction about how you could start a business that is better for society and the environment and that is better suited for you as a person, as a human being. So, you know, and it really all starts with the fact that business is the most effective form of activism. Of course, when we think of activism, you know, we think of organizations like Greenpeace, <laughs> you know, or Extinction Rebellion, uh, or, or, you know, and we tend to think, of course, of, of grassroots, not-for-profit, uh, volunteer-led and driven, you know, the, these kinds of organizations. But it turns out, actually, that, you know, the activists don't necessarily have a, uh, a monopoly, <laughs> you know, on being able to uh, change the world uh, with their actions. Businesses are actually very well suited to do this, but <laughs> you need to get rid of that pesky profit motive that keeps messing things up. <laughs> with, you know, because we have this with social enterprises. Uh, like, for example, you've got uh, Tom's Shoes, right, you know, started by, by uh, Blake Mikowski. And he, you know, started Tom's Shoes, which is basically a buy one, give one, you know, buy a pair of shoes, then a, another pair of shoes goes to Africa. Uh, what sort of wound up happening at a certain point was that uh, he wound up selling the company and, uh, well, became extremely rich. And he was like, oops, that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> So, but really though, the question is, how can we create the impact vehicle without accidentally getting other people unreasonably wealthy, right? Because that shouldn't be the reason why we're doing it. And if we're purely trying to create business as an activistic vehicle, <laughs> you know, then we need to figure out really how to separate out that whole, uh, the, the profit motive element from the actual, you know, act of getting something done. You know, because business at its fundament is nothing more than a group of people getting together to do something, you know, in a financially self-sustaining way. That's it. That's all that business has to be, you know? Also the markets, the financial markets, things like buying, selling, you know? I mean, these are fairly neutral concepts. The problem here is that uh, we have put this layer of neoliberalistic baggage on top of it <laughs> that essentially subverts it and, and causes it to sort of ser serve other purposes. The question here is, with business as activism, is how can we use capitalism as a tool to fight neoliberalism? 
And this is not <laughs> you know, the way that, uh, that most people would frame things. But the activists, too, that are in this room need to understand that business doesn't need to be a dirty word, <laughs> that it's just another tool in our arsenal that we can wield to make change. Another thing is uh, business as a mixed media for art, right? <laughs> you know, if you go up to most artists and say, uh, you know, you can use business as a form of art, they'll look at you funny <laughs> and, and think it's slightly offensive because <laughs> business is evil, right? But does it have to be? You know, can you make art with business? Also, business as a form of spirituality, right? I'm not going to go too deep into this right now because we're going to go into more detail in this, uh, in the, the work groups that we're going to have. Uh, you all should already, hopefully, be signed up for uh, tutorial groups on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. <laughs> and uh, we're going to go into a whole lot of detail on these topics uh, with some discussions uh, during the working group. So I'm going to leave this for now. Uh, but also business as a form of creative expression. But here's the thing. We're not usually told <laughs> to, to think of business in this way. Business, most of the time, we're told, is a vehicle for building wealth for shareholders. You know, but business can be so much more than this. And it has to be, you know, if we hope to, uh, to move things forward with our society and with our planet. All right. So we're going to start now with the second part uh, of this course, which is examining the status quo. So how are things nowadays, and what exactly is wrong with them? So it all starts with the concept of financial extraction. By financial extraction, what I'm talking about is unnecessarily removing wealth from businesses beyond middle class salaries and pensions that you would be using to pay your staff. <coughs> this extraction can take many different forms, you know, dividends, bonuses, <laughs> excessive CEO compensation, <laughs> uh, you know, exits, of course, you know, and, and, and excessive sale of equity, these kinds of things. This is where the financial extraction tends to happen from our businesses. We also, of course, uh, understand that there's a growth imperative for our businesses, right? You know, our businesses have to grow. It always has to get bigger. You know, bigger is better, right? But why? It turns out that financial extraction is at the root of the growth imperative. And I'm going to explain this with a story. So there is a parable that is called the story of the 11th round that was written by uh, an economist named uh, Bernard Lietire. Uh He's uh, from Belgium. And uh, also the uh, story was adapted and expanded a bit by Charles Eisenstein in his book, Sacred Economics. It's a very good book, by the way, <laughs> which I would highly recommend to all of you uh, if you have the time. So it starts out with uh, a village in the outback. And there's a number of villagers there who are trading and bartering, you know, with, with chickens and bread and uh, other kinds of grains and, and cows, right? And then one day, a stranger shows up at the village. And he has a white hat and shiny shoes. And he says, oh, you villagers, you're so primitive. You know, carrying around these chickens. This is so much hassle, so much work. There's a better way, and I'm going to teach you how to do it. So what I want for you to do is I want you to take a leather cowhide, and I want you to, uh, to give this to me, and then I will come back in a day with something that will solve your problems for you. So, you know, the villagers at this point, they're curious what the, uh, what the stranger has to offer. So they bring him the cowhide, and then they leave, and then he comes back the next day. And he says, well, what I have done is I have cut rounds out of this cowhide. And what I'm going to do is I am going to give each of the villagers 10 rounds. And then what you can do is when you want to swap and barter, 
rather than actually physically you know, carrying around the chickens, what you can do is you can actually just exchange these rounds instead. <laughs> you know, and, then, and each round represents the value of one single chicken. <laughs> yeah? And so the villagers, they, they, you know, they, they take these rounds, and it turns out that, hey, this is easier. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, you know, this, this representation of a chicken, you know, th this, this value, you know, that's in this round. And then they go back to the stranger and they're like, thank you so much. How can we ever thank you, you know, for this great service that you have given to me? And then what the, uh, what the stranger said is, uh, well, what, 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 what's going to happen is I'm going to leave and I'm going to come back in one year's time. And what I want you to do for me is I want each of you to give me back an 11th round. So the villagers are thinking about this, and they're like, well, OK, but uh, how exactly are we supposed to get this 11th round? How exactly are we supposed to pay back this stranger? So it turns out that uh, there are three options that these villagers have for paying the stranger back. Now, the first option is to, you know, each family has 10 rounds. What you can do is you can actually cut out one out of every 10 families, <laughs> right? <laughs> Basically, you know, steal their rounds. And then uh, at that point, uh, then, uh, you know, some of the families will have 11 rounds they can give back to the stranger. And then the other family will basically be bankrupt and, uh, <laughs> you know. They didn't th think that was necessarily a good option, right? So the second option at that point is default. So the when the stranger comes back, we're going to grab a pitchfork and, and chase him away. Well, they decided that was also kind of an unfriendly option. <laughs> so uh, the third option that they came up with was just quite simply to breed more chickens. <laughs> You know, because if each chicken is worth one round, then basically as long as there's more chickens at this time next year, then, uh, you know, they can basically give that 11th round or basically the extra chicken back to the uh, stranger and then they've solved their problem. So that's exactly what they do. <laughs> so the stranger comes back in a year's time, you know, he receives a whole bunch of uh, chickens, <laughs> you know, from the, uh, from the villagers who were using the rounds and he says, great. It's really nice to see that this system was working so well for you. So for next year, I'm going to basically cut out some new rounds and give you some more rounds. And I'll come back again at this time next year. And so it goes. Year after year, the stranger keeps coming back. He receives the whole load of extra chickens, you know, and everyone has fulfilled their obligations to the stranger. But after a number of years, something very strange starts happening. There's too many chickens, <laughs> you know? So at a certain point, it's like, you know, we've got more chicken meat than we can eat. We're getting sick of having it every day. We don't need more feather pillows. We've got enough of them. And on top of that, you know, all this chicken poop is everywhere. And that beautiful blue lake that we had is starting to turn all brown and, and disgusting, you know, because, uh, because of all this, this chicken <laughs> excrement, you know, that's going in there, you know? And, this, you know, basically leads us to the situation where we are in today. That stranger introduced financial extraction into their economy. And with that financial extraction, this was the root cause that necessitated economic growth. And it was the economic growth that then uh, put the pressure on their societies, for example, for the families to compete with one another, to cut each other out, or alter and this was also what led to environmental degradation. So one thing we need to keep in mind here is that extraction, financial extraction, is the original sin of business. It's also the original sin of finance, by the way. <laughs> In either case, uh, the whole concept, it's called usury. Believe it or not, we were talking about business as spirituality. 
the concept of usury, of financial extraction, is extremely heavily visited <coughs> in the Bible of all places. <laughs> and to quote the Christian Bible, I'm not Christian, by the way, but to quote it anyway, uh, you know, the, uh, the root of all evil is the love of money. All right. Now, financial extraction has multiple layers. Um, and uh, again, we're going to break this into micro, meso, and macro. So on the micro level, with financial extraction, with usury, uh, there's the concept of personal debt. We're familiar with this on a, on a personal level with things like uh, student loans, uh, mortgage debt, <laughs> credit card debt, <laughs> you know. Uh, similarly, on a meso level, uh, the financial extraction most of the time takes the form of corporate equity or otherwise uh, debt financing. And that's what pulls the value out of our businesses. On a macro level, <laughs> uh, you've got concepts like international development loans. I'm sure you all have heard of the uh, IMF <laughs> and the World Bank <laughs> you know, and a number of other development banks. Now, all of these tools, you know, we, we, we make jokes sometimes about debt slavery. It's not a joke. Because when you're in debt, what's happening is you are being forced to basically operate in service of whoever is, is giving you, you know, lending you that line of credit, <laughs> basically. You know, and this happens on a personal level, a business level, and also on a macro level. And there's a really great book, it's called Confessions of an Economic Hitman uh, by John Perkins that actually talks about how he was a so-called economic hitman uh, working for an international development bank and how debt, for example, helping with development projects, things like building bridges, schools, <coughs> dams, but, you know, <laughs> railroads, basically the more expensive the project, the better, how that was actually used as a tool to take over countries and make them lose their autonomy. <laughs> Anyhow, it's a very good book. I would highly recommend uh, that you read it. So coming back then to the concept of growth, do we need it? You know, we've got the whole concept of GDP, gross domestic product. You know? And GDP is the measure of economic growth for countries, for nation states. GDP is a big deal, right? GDP is what determines whether or not you have a, your, your country has a, has a seat at the, at the G20. You know, for politicians, really, economic growth is everything. <laughs> but why? Why is this the case? Why is GDP our measure of wealth? Of course, there have been some other initiatives, things like uh, gross national happiness, <laughs> you know, that people have kind of put out there as alternative measures of prosperity uh, for people in a, in a nation. You know? But the question really then becomes, you know, can we thrive without growth? This is the question that the post-growth economics movement is asking, can we thrive without growth? The degrowth movement goes one step further, and then they're asking, well, can we actually thrive while shrinking <laughs> economically? Here's the thing. Most people hear these terms, post-growth, degrowth, and they shut off. And the reason why they shut off is because they think, well, that means I have to sacrifice things, right? Like degrowth, that's scary. It means I need to give up everything that I want, like my iPhone and my MacBook Pro, and I need to live in a cave, and I need to sacrifice everything. That's what people think that degrowth actually is. But I don't think that that <laughs> is necessarily what degrowth really is. It's rather asking the question, how do we thrive? How do we prosper in economic conditions that happen to be going down? This is not a hypothetical question because we just so happen to be in a recession right now. <laughs> so given the fact that right now we are in recessionary conditions, I would say the question, how do we thrive when we're not growing, is a pretty relevant question. <laughs> you know, Because you can see there's a lot of 
not thriving that's happening at the moment. You can see that inflation is completely rampant. We can see that uh, house prices are going up, uh, you know, in, in ways that are preventing people from being able to buy houses. The cost of education is going up. The cost of food is going up. Uh, you know, wages aren't going up quite as fat, fast, you know, and a lot of people are getting laid off. I mean, particularly from big tech companies. The question is, how can we how can we have economic decline and prevent all these things from happening? Relevant question. There's another really good book called Prosperity Without Growth by Tim Jackson. It was also, uh, I think, uh, on our re reading list, uh, basically, in, in Canvas uh, for this class. This is also the classic of post-growth. Tim Jackson, without a doubt, is the father of post-growth. <laughs> You know, so this is a very, very good book to be reading. Uh, similarly, also with degrowth, Jason Hickel also I would say wrote one of the classics uh, of degrowth, Less is More, which is also worth reading. Anyway, but that is uh, what this class is uh, taking as our framework that we're working on in on a macroeconomic level. But of course, again, macroeconomic level, that's great. That's a meta concept. But how do I translate this now back into what we can do as entrepreneurs and business leaders? Now, this brings us to another great economist <laughs> whose name is Kate Rayworth. So uh, how many of you here have heard of uh, donut economics? <laughs> all right. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure you all. Uh, are a bit familiar with her. She is a Kate Rayworth is an Oxford uh, macroeconomist. She actually uh, got an endowed chair at the at the uh, Hochschule von Amsterdam at the uh, Amsterdam University College, uh, which is also pretty cool. So uh, <laughs> occasionally she's around. And uh, if you haven't already read her book Donut Economics, that's another one that I really highly recommend. And if you don't have the time to read her book, uh, at least watch her TED talk. She has a really amazing TED talk that's called A Healthy Economy Should Be Designed to Thrive and Not Grow. <coughs> now, uh, in her TED talk, she talks, of course, about GDP and why is it that we need you know, to, to, grow, to grow. And she also, of course, explains that, well, we need growth uh, for, of our GDP because there's so much financial extraction in our economy that we need to continue growing just to maintain a steady state. But then what she does is she calls upon uh, nature to provide the good example for us. So she says, consider growth, right? So consider a natural creature, like a tree or a human child, right? At the very beginning of its life, a tree grows really quickly, almost exponentially. But then what happens is this tree, it starts to level off. You know, it reaches its maximum size. And at that point, the tree stops growing and it starts thriving. At that point, well, the tree can't grow anymore. <laughs> it's reached its maximum size. But if the tree wants to continue growing, what does it do next? It drops seeds. And then those seeds form new little trees. And her question is, if this is how nature does it, then why is it any different with our businesses? See, there's one prominent thing in nature that grows exponentially forever. It's cancer. And it is toxic to any environment that it is living upon. So why then does exponential growth inform how we do business? So the real question then that we're going to pose here is with our businesses, how is it that we can move from businesses with exponential growth curves to businesses with flat ones? <coughs> All right, next topic, Silicon Valley. <laughs> So, you know, we all have heard plenty about Silicon Valley, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, there's TV shows about it. Uh, I just saw a new one recently about uh, 
Uber, you know, uh, showing you know, Trevor Kalanick and all his, you know, ups and downs. You know, it, it certainly makes for good entertaining uh, watching. You know, on top of that, we think that Silicon Valley is the gold standard for how we should do entrepreneurship, right? <laughs> you know, and to be fair, like, look, I'm a techie. You know, I've been to San Francisco and the Bay Area plenty of times, and I can tell you it feels like Walhalla going there, you know, walking around the Google campus, you know, and, you know, Apple and Cupertino and Facebook, or pardon me, Meta, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, but still, I mean, all the garages, you know, with like, uh, you know, the old HP garage and the Computer History Museum. I mean, as a technologist, Silicon Valley, even to me, feels like hollowed ground <laughs> because of the history and uh, of so much technological development that's happened there. You know, Stanford University also, again, you know, gold standard of, of entrepreneurship, education. So many of these big successful companies started there, you know, and you would think obviously what they are doing there is, is worth copying. Everyone wants to be the next Silicon Valley, right? You know, Amsterdam wants to be the Silicon Valley of the Netherlands. The Netherlands wants to be the Silicon Valley of Europe, you know, whatever. <laughs> but let's ask the question, do we really want to be like the Silicon Valley? Here's this other pesky thing. If you go to Silicon Valley, you know, which is basically a colloquial name for the San Francisco Bay, San Francisco Bay Area, and you walk around, you're going to notice something. You're going to notice an awful lot of drug-addicted homeless people walking around. <laughs> Douglas Rushkoff, who's another amazing economist, he wrote a book uh, that was titled Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus. <laughs> you know, qu quite an apt name, you know. Of course, the, the amount of gentrification that occurred in that area, you know, not everybody there in the San Francisco Bay Area is happy. You know, all of this prosperity that Silicon Valley has delivered has not been evenly distributed. So let me ask you again, do we still want to be the next Silicon Valley here in Amsterdam, even, or in the Netherlands? I'd rather not. <laughs> so, uh, but that's, uh, that's just my opinion. But then what is this Silicon Valley model that has blown over from across the ocean that we're now attempting to emulate here in Europe? It has three parts, capital, scale, exit. That's it, you know, it's really familiar. I'm sure everyone here in this room has probably seen this already. This is nothing new to you. So let's break it down in each of its pieces. Capital. So capital has many different forms, you know, uh, VC rounds, seed rounds, convertible loans, you know, it could also be debt financing. We are told that we need uh, financing, we need VC money in order to be able to start a business. And the question that not enough of us ask is, is this true? Is it true? Do I actually need VC to start a business? Now let's consider this rationally. Silicon Valley as such, and the whole VC ecosystem is what, maybe about 40 years old? How did we manage to start businesses before VCs existed? Gee, maybe through launching customers. <laughs> Imagine that, <laughs> you know? It could have also been through bank loans, it could have also been, you know, family, friends, and fools, but you definitely didn't have soft banks dropping dumps of 100 million on top of your business. It just didn't happen, <laughs> you know, back before this creative destruction of Silicon Valley. So saying that we actually need that investment to start a business is a myth, <laughs> you know, and it's one that needs to be questioned. Another thing also that we don't think about often enough is that when we accept venture capital, you now have a boss. You know, people start businesses because they want to work for themselves, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, because they want to create some kind of bus business or company that works for them. <laughs> but the moment that you have a VC on board, you are now serving their goals, not your own anymore. And a lot of people don't think about the trade-off and autonomy 
that you are making when you accept that venture capital. And the other thing also is that the entire startup ecosystem completely overhypes venture capital. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's in our very linguistics, our very terminology, like angel investors, like they're angels, right? Well, actually, early stage VCs give you the worst terms. <laughs> So, you know, but, but the point is that, you know, he who has the most money controls the narrative. <laughs> they have the largest marketing budget. So a lot of what they're telling us about capital, <laughs> you know, we, uh, we, we just take because they are controlling the institutions that, uh, you know, that, that we're learning <laughs> our business and entrepreneurship from. I guess then I'll, I'll finish up this slide uh, with one more story, and it's about Google. So with Google, right, it all started with Don't Be Evil, you know? Larry Page and Sergey Brin, you know, they started the company, grad students at Stanford, really great intentions. They wanted to organize the world's information. They <laughs> took their back rug algorithm, started, you know, this, uh, this, this company around it with the don't be evil. And of course, at a certain point, they accepted venture capital. <laughs> After that point, uh, the CEO, Larry Page, got replaced by Eric Schmidt. A little bit later, Google purchased DoubleClick. And a little bit later than that, don't be evil just kind of mysteriously disappeared. <laughs> you know? I mean, looking at Google now, of course, they're successful, <laughs> you know? I mean, they're, they're one of the largest companies on the planet, so I mean, how could they not be a success, right? But then again, are they really, you know, unequivocally successful? Have they actually really ushered in all of the changes and the world, you know, that we want to live in? I can imagine that Larry and Sergey, you know, in retrospect, there might have been a few things they might have wanted to do differently. <laughs> But of course, at a certain point, they too had accepted that venture capital and had lost control over the direction of their company. Imagine what Google also could have been had it remained also more autonomous. So anyhow, I'm going to uh, stop here for right now. Uh, it is now uh, noon. So we're going to take a 10 minute break and I would like it if you could be back here by 12.10. So the next part of the Silicon Valley model is scaling. But the question here is, what exactly are we scaling? Are we scaling revenue? Are we scaling profits? Are we scaling the number of people in our company? <laughs> right? You know? Uh, of course, uh, scaling revenues when you're actually making losses, you know, it, it means that you're just making losses faster. So this, you know, the distinction makes a very large difference. Another commonly accepted, you know, piece of common sense that we always get is that venture capital is an accelerator for your company. But again, this begs the question of what exactly is it that we're accelerating? Are we accelerating profitability? <laughs> Are we accelerating customer acquisition? Of course, as, as always, the answer is it depends. Here's the thing. VC does not always scale. In fact, most of the times, usually, it does not scale profitability. And here's the thing. If you want to be a business, particularly one that is not you know, externally, financially dependent <laughs> on, on other sources of capital for your survival, then the point is you would need to turn a profit with your company to survive, right? <laughs> you know? So uh, the point here is that <clears throat> having capital does not make you more profitable, and it certainly does not make you more profitable faster. Here's the reason why. Let's say that from out the heavens, a VC drops a big bunch of money on me. 
right? <laughs> and then tells me, go build your business with it. What am I going to do? Well, probably I'm going to spend that money, right? <laughs> you know? So what am I going to do as a founder? I'm probably going to pay myself a salary because that's comfortable. <laughs> of course I want to earn a salary. Maybe I'm going to hire a bunch of other people who can help me and pay all of them salaries too. Of course, bearing in mind that salaries are the largest expense most of the time for businesses because quite simply people are expensive. Maybe I'm going to buy some real estate, like an office, right? You know, because <laughs> of course, you know, real companies have offices, right? And maybe I'm going to buy some comfy desk chairs, you know, and a, and a nice new MacBook because, hey, you know, I need all those kinds of things too uh, for my business. But then the problem with all of this is with all of these capital expenditures, you have something called a burn rate. You know? And if you take the size of the pile of capital that you have and you divide it by the burn rate, then you get something called a runway, which is the period of time that you have before the whole thing falls over. <laughs> and at the point when it falls over, you basically have two choices. One, uh, you can either uh, fold the company, <laughs> you know, that happens sometimes. Or the other thing that you can do is go crawling back to the VCs to ask for more money which they might give you, uh, but you know, you'll probably get less good terms than last time for the new capital injection. You know, so the point here is when you actually start without capital, <laughs> it can be a blessing in disguise because it allows you to start lean and mean. I can give you an example. When I first started Radically Open Security, my cybersecurity company, an angel investor had offered me a half a million euros. Nice offer, right? <laughs> I turned it down. Why did I turn it down? Well, quite simply because I didn't want to give up control over, over my company. <laughs> However, turning down that offer from the angel investor had consequences. And that consequence of my turning him down was that I didn't have any money, <laughs> at least not, you know, beyond uh, what I had in my own <laughs> savings account. And, uh, you know, I mean, granted, I'm a techie and I'd been working for, uh, for some tech companies like, uh, you know, uh, Citrix and I worked at ING for a while. So I, I had some savings. So I knew that I could sur survive for a year or two but before having to get a real job <laughs> if things didn't work out with the company. So in that sense, I was in a position of privilege. But all the same, uh, I sure as heck was not going to hire anybody else, you know, if I wasn't able to pay myself a salary. So what it meant is that because we didn't have much money, we had to start lean and mean. So what I did was I started my business as a platform. And when you talk about platforms, yes, I'm talking about exactly the same kind of platform as Uber, Airbnb, you know, with a platform, what you're doing is you are matching a producer, with a consumer, <laughs> uh, with the platform in the middle. And I started basically with something that I would call a minimum viable platform, which was basically asking the question, you know, can I, uh, you know, come up with some kind of a value proposition <laughs> and business model that I can have one producer and one consumer and then the platform in the middle and I can have some margin that I can put on top of the revenue that I make from that transaction that I can reinvest into building the business. That's the definition of a minimum viable platform. Now, I started with that. At the very beginning, if you only have one producer and one consumer, you're not going to obviously be able to run a business off of that, <laughs> right? But what a lot of people don't understand, though, about revenue, particularly if you are selling services, is that you have customers, and if these customers are happy, they come back. And here's the thing, with venture capital, you get it, you spend it once, and it's gone. It's the same thing also with other external funding. Same thing with subsidies even. They might not have strings attached, but you get it, you spend it, it's gone. Whereas with customers, it compounds like money in a bank account. <laughs> Which basically means that uh, if my customers are happy and I have this minimum viable platform, I've got customer number one, you know, and then they buy something, right? And then I get a second customer, and then, you know, they buy something as well. Then customer one comes back, right? Then I get customer three. 
At this point, then maybe one and three come back, then I get customer four, then one, two, and four come back, then I get customer five. You can see how it has this kind of snowball effect. So ironically enough, I think actually that growing profitability <laughs> is far easier to do when you're bootstrapping than when you start out with capital. Another thing also is that this kind of hyper growth, right? I mean, this is actually the reason why 90% of startups these days fail. <laughs> I'm sure you all have heard the statistic, you know, that nine out of every 10 startups fail. The point is that trying to artificially bulk up as fast as possible, <laughs> you know, is not a good way to control your burn rate. And the other thing also is that when you receive a pile of capital in the first place, it creates a product market disconnect, right? So uh, what this means is, you know, and, and particularly technologists my, but like myself are susceptible to this. I get a bunch of money. What am I going to build? Well, I'm probably going to build a beautiful piece of technology, right? You know, I've got this thing in my head and I'm going to make it gorgeous and exactly what I want it to be and it's going to use all the latest, greatest, shiny technologies and it's going to be amazing. There's only one problem. At a certain point, that money runs out and then I'm like, okay, now I've got this wonderful, awesome thing that's my baby. I wonder if someone will buy it. Mm. Yeah, then it turns out that they don't. <laughs> And the problem is that when you start out with capital, you are very inclined to build, as a developer, what you want to build rather than what the market wants you to build. <laughs> you know? And that is the whole reason why Eric Ries wrote the book, The Lean Startup. <laughs> you know? I don't know if any of you are familiar with the book, The Lean Startup, uh, or have read it, another business classic that I would <laughs> highly recommend. But what he says is basically that you have to start with what's called a minimum viable product, an MVP. And then you need to collect validated learning by essentially trying to sell something. Because if you just ask people, hey, do you like what I built? What do you think they're going to do? They're going to say, of course, I love it. And then you ask a follow-up question, well, great, do you want to buy one? And then they're like, no. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this happens all the time. <laughs> So the thing is, the only input, the only feedback that you can trust from people is they're actually buying something. <laughs> so, okay, so MVP, collect validated learning. Then you pivot to follow the pain in the market, and then you rapidly iterate. This is basically the lean startup in a nutshell. It's a bit like uh, agile uh, for, uh, for business, you know, kind of. <laughs> you know, and you can build really complex things uh, in, in a robust way by using rapid iterations. <laughs> so, you know, but getting a huge pile of investment capital at the beginning is the exact opposite of this. <laughs> because basically what you're doing, you're building this, this one grand thing, <laughs> you know, and trying to get it right the first time when it actually turns out that, uh, you know, you're not going to know at the very beginning what you need to build, and you need instead to make a bunch of different smaller experiments. So, you know, so anyway, it's just this form of, uh, you know, financing. I mean, yes, VCs do tend to give their startup founders a copy of the lean startup, <laughs> but of course, by the time you get that initial investment, I'm not going to say it's too late, but I mean, that in investment is not actually really conducive to practicing the lean startup, you know, but not enough people think about this. When you start with nothing, it forces you to have a laser focus on your value proposition and your business model, which gives you the most solid possible foundation on which you can build layer by layer. You know? And that is the way to build a financially sound business. So let me tell you again, you know, ask you again, is VC an accelerator <laughs> for profitability? Probably not. All right. The next part of the uh, Silicon Valley model is the exit. Now, the exit is our definition of success in business. If you're a founder and you want people to think you're a success, then you sell your company. If you want to be even more successful, 
then you do that multiple times, and then you're you know, a serial entrepreneur. <laughs> you know, you want to take the next step after that, become a VC. <laughs> that, that's usually how it works you know, in, the, uh, in the whole Silicon Valley ecosystem. But yeah, I guess by that measure, I'm not very successful, <laughs> right? You know, I'm uh, probably the only CEO of a cybersecurity company of my size and my maturity that has not sold the company. <coughs> But yeah, of course it hasn't sold the company, right? I mean, you know, I set it up so it's basically impossible to sell. You know, and I have had conversations, somewhat awkward conversations, with, uh, well, there was one large uh, cyber Silicon Valley-based cybersecurity company whose name I won't mention, but I was speaking, actually, I think a month ago, with uh, a woman who was very highly positioned there, and I was telling her about radically open security, and she was like, wow. And I thought to myself, you know, radically open security would make a really great acquisition target. But then you told me how you were organized, and then, yeah, never mind. <laughs> yeah. And look, you, of course, you really have to know what you want <laughs> to, uh, to take this kind of a path. Because, look, I know what I'm sacrificing. You know, I read the same trade journals and industry press, you know, and it isn't escaping my attention that a lot of the CEOs of other cybersecurity companies, a lot of my colleague CEOs are selling their companies for tens of millions. I know. I know, but here's the thing: if I didn't, you know, if I if I didn't set up radically open security the way that I did, I wouldn't be here now, teaching you what I'm teaching you, you know. And at a certain point, you need to ask yourself what's important to you. Are you doing this because you want to create an impact vehicle for positive change, or are you just doing it because you want to get rich? I think actually that most people want to do good in the world. Call me naive. Right? <laughs> you know, but I actually, for the most part, believe in the goodness of people. I think that people do want to make a positive difference, and I believe that people are intrinsically motivated. But the problem, though, is we have good people in a toxic system, and even <coughs> folks who have good intentions, like social entrepreneurs, who step into the system, they say, I'm not doing it for the money, but then the, f the larger forces push them in that direction, a la the whole uh, Blake Mikowski uh, story. So, all right. But here, I guess, is the thing about exits. So exits are also the moment when the financial value is pulled out of your company. We were talking about that whole financial extraction thing. The exit is the single largest moment most of the time when financial extraction is pulled out of companies. So if you're trying to build non-extractive companies you know, to help form a non-extractive economy, this is a moment particularly that you have to pay a lot of attention to. And here's the thing. We are treating our startups like chickens, really, <laughs> you know? In, uh, in Dutch, we've got a really great term for this. It's called uh, plofkip, <laughs> which uh, basically uh, in, in English, I guess exploding chicken doesn't really translate. But, uh, but the point is, you know, this is like farm chickens, the kind that live in these batteries. And the way that it works is we take our startups and we force feed them investment capital so they can grow nice and juicy and plump and attractive looking, right? Preferably within three to five years. Until the moment of their liquidation, which is that moment that the, you know, basically the, the startup is, uh, you know, slaughtered, the financial value is pulled out of the company and it leaves a dysfunctional carcass of a, st <laughs> of, of a company left over, yeah? Exits are super destructive <laughs> to companies, you know? I mean, partly because, you know, companies have trouble working without capital. <laughs> you're, you're taking a lot of cash out of the company. And the other thing also is also certainly in the cases of acquisitions, you know, mergers and acquisitions, you're also trying to merge the cultures of two different organizations. And oftentimes that doesn't go very well and also has the effect of basically uh, financial, well, I mean, <laughs> culturally speaking, very much destroying the company. Oftentimes after that point, uh, you have staff attrition, a lot of the more senior people leave, uh, you know. It's usually not very good for the company having an exit anyhow. And the problem here is we have turned our startup ecosystem 
into a <laughs> casino for investors. So the way that it is, we know that nine out of every 10 startups are going to fail. That means that only one is going to succeed. So we can think about these startups as a series of lottery tickets. It means that since you know there's going to be nine failures, that one startup that succeeds, it needs to be a really big success. You know, it can't just be a moderate success. It can't just be a nice lifestyle company. No, no, no. It has to be a unicorn. <laughs> you know? And here's the reason why. It has to, first of all, recoup the losses from all the other nine startups. And then after it's done doing that, it needs to return basically multiples on the investment uh, of the VC's investors, you know, preferably you know, 2x, 3x, maybe even more. I mean, that's a really big responsibility. And what that basically means is you need to hit a home run. <laughs> you know? A moderate success is completely worthless to the VC. But of course, remember, a VC's interests are not the same as yours. Most of us are not necessarily looking you know, for, for, for a hyper growth leading to a, a huge IPO, I mean, you know, and, and, and absurd amounts of money, most of us are just looking to create a business that works for us, especially in the case of social enterprise, right? <laughs> you know, and, and there's different ways of thinking that bigger isn't always better. You know, a business should serve you, not the other way around. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know? And there are some books like uh, The Big Enough Company, uh, also Four Hour Work Week, you know, by Tim Ferriss. I mean, really great one, because he also talks about actually how you don't need that much money to do most of what you want to do in your life. You know, we're, we tend to be sometimes money rich and time poor. <laughs> you know, and if we're a little bit creative, we can actually optimize for having more time <laughs> and more freedom to actually be able to be able to pursue the things that really matter to us. You know? And that's not what the VCs want, <laughs> right? So we have to understand then with these exits, it's their goal, but should it really be our goal? All right, so that leads us to another related topic of valuations, you know? So a valuation is sort of the estimated value of a company I'm sure you guys have sort of heard the term being thrown around that, oh, but valuations are fictional. But what, what exactly does that mean, right? So a valuation basically means that you take the price of a share of stock from the most recent funding round, and then you multiply that by all outstanding shares of stock. That number that comes out of it is the valuation. So that's pretty simple. Now, uh, 37 Signals, which uh, l well later cha changed their name to uh, Basecamp. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of uh, Jason Fried, uh, who's a bit of an uh, interesting uh, <laughs> entrepreneur who's also written some good books that you should read. Um, he wrote a satirical blog post. And he basically said in his blog post, roughly, uh, that uh, congratulations to us. We have sold 0.000000000001% of our company for $1. That gives us a valuation of 100 billion. Go us. Now, yeah, I mean, mathematically, <laughs> that is actually how valuations work. You know, and that is why this blog post was funny. <laughs> it's satire. But the thing is, well, actually, it's not quite so funny when this happens in real life. <laughs> See, here's the thing. Uh, Kleiner Perkins, uh, Caulfield and Byers, they put 20 million into Snapchat back into May 2014. And this was at a moment when Snapchat had zero revenue. In other words, they were only burning cash. They were not selling anything, right? And then for a tiny ownership stake. And by putting this 20 million in for a very, very small ownership stake, it gave the company a valuation of 10 billion US dollars, which basically put it in the same league as Uber, Airbnb, you know, all the, the basically, you know, decacorn giants, basically. 
Um, yeah, now it's not so funny. <laughs> uh, but that's actually what happens. <laughs> you know, just take small overpriced investments in something just with the sole purpose of causing the valuation to shoot up. Have the IPO, cash out. Easy, right? But this has led to the situation where uh, startups have essentially become unprofitable cashing out shell operations. And uh, the problem here is that we're actually conducting a kind of pump and dump scheme onto the public markets. So if you have a company that is bleeding cash before the IPO, then chances are it is still going to be bleeding cash after the IPO. Because let's face it, nothing in its business model has changed. So, but what happens here though, is that uh, we're taking this inherently unprofitable thing and we are hyping it and we're blowing the whole thing up, you know, in the media, you know, all kinds of really great press saying, yeah, yeah, this is the best company, visionary CEO, going to take over the world, you know. And then at that point, uh, they sell the shares onto the market. And then, uh, yeah, at that point, it, you know, once they've dumped the shares, it doesn't really matter what direction <laughs> they go in. At that point, they've cashed out. And, and, you know, those who, the original share owners, including the VCs and the founders, can just leave. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not their problem anymore, right? A and then you can ask the question of why is it then that people actually buy those shares of an unprofitable company during the IPO? And people buy them because of something called the greater fool theory. They're speculating on the price of those shares, right? So with the greater fool theory, it basically means you don't actually care what you're buying as long as th there's a greater fool who will come after you who's willing to pay more. That's all you care about, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know? And this works in a growth economy, not so much in a recession. You know? But the greater fool theory is the basis of the IPO market and the stock market, and cryptocurrency, and NFTs, and tulips, you know, back in the Netherlands all those years ago. You know, the point is that, uh, you know, it's all speculation. And again, it works in growth economies, but uh, when we are in different economic conditions, such as we're facing right now, you can see how this whole uh, house of cards starts to implode. But the thing is, most companies now have sort of gotten used to doing it this way. And part of what's caused this is an uh, investment uh, company called SoftBank. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of the SoftBank uh, Vision Fund. But it's run by a, uh, uh, well, basically by an investment banker uh, from Tokyo who has gotten all kinds of money from basically, I think, Saudi oil barons <laughs> and a few other sovereign wealth funds, among other sources. And he's basically making mega investments in companies. You know, we're talking like 100 million, you know, really enormous, you know. And what they're essentially trying to do here is they are trying to subsidize the forming of monopolies. So that basically they can take over the market, put all the smaller players uh, out of business. You know, this might not necessarily be what we want, but this is what organizations like SoftBank are attempting to do. Of course, again, this works in growth economies where you have a lot of IPOs, but the moment that we're in different economic conditions like the downturn right now, there's not as many IPOs happening at the, at the moment. And of course, SoftBank lost a whole lot of money. But the thing was, uh, in those glory days with low interest rates, uh, SoftBank really made waves, you know? And they, I mean, really those mega investments they were making shook up Silicon Valley, who then felt prompted to compete with these mega investments from SoftBank. And this had a huge effect on the entire rest of the VC industry, really causing these investments and the valuations to, uh, to balloon. Now the problem with all of this is 
this style of pumping and dumping of uh, equities onto the public market, this destroys the basic economics of entire industries. Now, let's say you have smaller companies uh, that are actually have a business model, you know, and that are trying to survive without external financing, like my company, for example, my cybersecurity company. You know, I have to live off of customer revenue. But the problem is, as a, as a company without external capital, it is very difficult to compete against a VC company that can burn cash, like in the case of WeWork, remember, they were spending money five times faster than they were getting it from customers. You know, it is hard to compete with that kind of a company with such a high burn rate that survives. You know? <laughs> and, and, you know, at that point, you know, if they're burning that much cash that quickly, well then, of course, they can afford to pay your staff better than you do. <laughs> of course, you know, they can afford to sell products and services at a lower cost, <laughs> you know, than companies who are actually behaving like companies, <laughs> you know, are, are, are able to, uh, to sell their products for. And that's the problem. They're actually not even companies at all. Any unprofitable cashing out shell organization, they, you know, they might call themselves, <laughs> they might call themselves a company in a particular field. But that's not actually what they are. If their business model is not selling the products and services that they're claiming, you know, that, that they're selling, their actual business model is equity. They are not, and I see this in the cybersecurity industry all the time. There's a bunch of hugely VC funded companies that are selling, selling cybersecurity monitoring appliances. I go, I've, the last two years I've been to the RSA conference in San Francisco, and you know, there's these huge booths with all these monitoring devices, you know? But the thing is, if you look underneath the hood, even in some larger companies that have been successful for a very long time, they have never earned a cent of profit ever. <laughs> that's the dirty secret. And they call themselves cybersecurity companies, but actually that's not what they are. They're financial institutions. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you all have heard the term shadow banking uh, before, but, uh, you know, but, but that's the point. These companies are being financialized and they're not actually surviving off of selling the product and service, but they're surviving off of selling equity, which then means the rest of us who are surviving off of selling that pro product and service, we have to compete. And this causes entire industries to evolve deformed <laughs> and incorrectly, you know, and, uh, and this is problematic. Yes. Yes. So I believe this uh, business model, if you ask these companies, like you say the financial institutions, because they, the profit comes from selling equities on the stock market, which is true because of these inflated valuations they get, right? Mm -hmm. So on short term, it works, right? But what they, what they argue is that they, they initially need to gain market share. Mm -hmm. As you said, become monopolies, mm -hmm. and then they can dictate the price, right? And then they will make huge profits, right? This is their this is their business model, and for some companies it works. Yeah, I'm not claiming that it doesn't work, but what I'm claiming is they're not really companies. <laughs> I mean, uh, call me chauvinistic, but I think real businesses are profitable. <laughs> now, convince me otherwise. <laughs> but look, companies can do. Look, there's a really neat trick uh, in economics that's called modern monetary theory. I'm not sure if any of you have, uh, have heard of it, MMT, but it's actually quite an interesting concept. Now what it is, is let's say you are a national, uh, a nation state with your own sovereign currency. So for example, let's say that I am the United States. You know, and I have a central bank who can print dollars, you know. Also within the European Commission, we've got the European Central Bank that can print euros. So Europe has a, has a sovereign currency. The Netherlands no longer has a sovereign currency because we gave up our guilder uh, in order to accept uh, the euro as our currency. 
Uh, but any nation state that still has control over their own currency, like, like the UK, for example, with the British pound, has the power of modern monetary theory. Now, what this is, most of us think that we have to balance budgets, sort of like a household. So, for example, uh, if I want to balance my budget, what it means is I need to look at what's coming in, and I need to look at the expenditures that are going out, and I need to make sure that, that I can maintain a balance with all this. And debt is bad, right? Because you know, for me, it, with my household, if I get into debt, it means I'm going to need to scrimp and save or get a job that pays better in order to be able to pay off that debt to correct the situation. Now, the thing is, with countries, it doesn't quite work that way <laughs> if you have your own sovereign currency because they've got a superpower that most you know, families do not have, and that's basically the... Uh, the ability to be able to print more currency, you know? <laughs> so if the U.S. government, for example, is in debt, uh, let's say to China, <laughs> for however many hundreds of billions or trillions, whatever, I mean, the point is that the U.S. that can then turn on the printing presses and then print more dollars, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then basically they can use those dollars to pay back China. So it's, you know, a lot of politicians tend to say, oh, but to balance our budget, it means we need to raise taxes or we need to cut government programs. That's not how it works. You just turn on the printing presses and voila, you've got the money. You know, and this ability of MMT, this is already used. Remember that pandemic that we had? And remember how all of a sudden, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Federal Reserve turned, and the ECB also turned on those printing presses and created unprecedented <laughs> amounts of money <laughs> in a short period of time to basically give comp corporate bailouts, you know, um, uh, that, that were closed during the pandemic, to, you know, in some places to send payments to individual people or, you know, uh, to uh, freelancers uh, here in the Netherlands, for example. Uh, they all got payments from the government while everything was shut down. That's funny. Snap your fingers. We got the money. You know, so then when people say things like, oh, but how are we going to find the money for a universal basic income? Oh, we'd have to raise taxes. Uh-uh. Nope. If you just decide to turn on the printing presses, you've got the money for it. So the point is that with the, all of these tools that the Federal Reserve has, it's not even about money creation, but it's actually about money redistribution. <laughs> you know, what you're doing is you're actually shifting the percentages of who has what. <laughs> so anyhow, but coming back to businesses, it turns out that actually businesses have exactly the same power. Because on the meso level with businesses, essentially equity, creating equity, creating shares of stock is exactly the same thing as having a sovereign currency. <laughs> so basically, as long as there's a social agreement that you are willing to pay real money for my shares, I can basically create an unlimited number of shares, <laughs> uh, you know, and get basically an unlimited amount of money for my company. The thing is, there needs to be a social agreement about this. As soon as people start thinking that my shares aren't worth anything and the price goes down, then I'm out of luck. <laughs> you know, but it's the same thing also with uh, national currencies as well. If you print too many, then you get uh, inflation because, you know, of course, then the value per dollar goes down. But if you also you give some of those dollars to people as a UBI, again, you're, it's, you're redistributing money throughout the economy by doing this. We also do this on the micro level, on the personal level, by doing things like creating our own cryptocurrency. Same thing. Cryptocurrency is basically a personal form of MMT. I've got my own currency. <laughs> as long as there's a social agreement that you're willing to pay me something for my Melanie coin, <laughs> you know, then uh, I can basically print as many as I want, and then I'm basically, you know. <laughs> but that's the point. Equity is exactly like this. And that's sort of why companies can print unlimited amount of sh amounts of shares. And as long as the world at large feels that those shares are worth real money, you know, and certain amounts of real money, it's a social agreement. And this is the reason why a single tweet from Elon Musk will cause share prices uh, to go absolutely crazy, because this whole thing is actually one big social agreement. So, so I arguing there is no such thing as an objective valuation. Objective what? 
valuation. Well, a valuation is just the most recently paid stock price multiplied by the number of yeah, outstanding shares. Yeah, but there is a decent of right? So, uh, so which gives you a number, right? So it puts, puts a, a number on the bed of the company. And that is not, uh, so it, it, is, it is kind of objective, right? So it's not that we can print unlimited number of shares and nothing happens in the value of the share. So <coughs> the, the, the share, perhaps. Yeah. The, the problem indeed is the more shares you print, then you can dilute the original people who had shares. But of course, sometimes when, they, when founders print new shares, uh, they also print more shares for themselves. So they can basically dilute everyone else, but not themselves. I mean, we saw this uh, with Snapchat, for example. Anyway, but uh, let's, uh, let's move on. So um, this brings us to a quote uh, from John Maynard Keynes. Uh, I'm going to read this, uh, even though you can also read off the slide. But um, he said, speculators may do no harm as bubbles on a steady stream of enterprise. But the position is serious when enterprise becomes the bubble on a whirlpool of speculation. When the capital development of a country becomes a byproduct of the activities of a casino, the job is likely to be ill done. <laughs> Anyhow, um, the class uh, ends now, right? Yep, OK. So this is, I guess, a, a good cliffhanger on which uh, we will leave things uh, till next time. So thank you so much for coming. And I will see you all next uh, Monday.